we frame things matters. And it's, of, uh, it's usually a difference in sort of a positive or negative way. I think it's probably common wisdom that you should see the glass half full, right? That's the optimist way to be. And oftentimes when we frame things, we are trying to pick a way of inhabiting our lives. And how we frame our lives, how we frame the people we interact with matters so deeply. And this morning, in this series we're in, Scriptures That Shaped My Faith, we get to look at a frame that Jesus gives us on how we are to interact with the people we have relationships with. God has used the text that I will talk about with you this morning to shape my life maybe more than any text he has plunked in my lap over the last five years. And God so often does that. He plunks it down in my lap. And what I mean by that is not some, don't over like mystify it. That God will put a passage in my way a couple times. That I'll read it or hear it or I'll come to my level of attention and awareness and God will just say, I have this for you, figure it out. And so I will go to the work of reading that scripture, meditating on that scripture, trying to understand what God has for me in that text. And so as we look at this text this morning, we're going to be in Mark 10. If you have a Bible, feel free to open up there. If not, you are free to follow along on the screen behind us. But if you look at Mark 10, it's about a number of different things. It's about discipleship and wealth and obedience and sacrifice. It is this convicting call to throw aside everything that holds you back from following Jesus wholly and completely. But what captures my heart most is actually nothing Jesus says. It's how Jesus shows up. It's how he interacts with the person he's speaking to. So you won't find the scripture that shaped my heart in quotation where marks this morning. It is literally a narrative comment that Mark puts in there as he wants to tell us about how Jesus interacted with this person. It is a ravishing picture of Jesus I hope to do some justice to this morning. And it's a text that has helped me do exactly what we are doing as a church. Trying to live and love like Jesus. I am so excited to share this with you this morning. Again, we'll be in Mark 10, and we'll start in verse 17. It says, as Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, Jesus is on his way. Where is he on his way to? He's on his way to Jerusalem. This is the last leg of the earthly ministry and journey of Jesus. He's headed to Jerusalem to lay down his life as a ransom for many. And word is out about him by this point. He's been publicly teaching for a number of years now. And so many people know that he's a wise teacher, someone who teaches with authority. And so it's not a surprise that a man would run up and fall on his knees before Jesus. And he tips his hand in his impression of Jesus by calling him good teacher. He sees Jesus as having something to offer. And then he goes straight for the good stuff. He asks, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Did you know that no one else asks that question in the New Testament? None of the disciples even ask Jesus, who they lived their day in and day out life with for three years, never bothered to ask Jesus, what must we do to inherit eternal life? Just this audacious young man who we will later find out is as the rich young ruler. Mark hasn't disclosed that, but if you know the parallel accounts in the other Gospels, this is the rich young ruler. He wants to make sure that he has read all the fine print, that he has checked all the boxes of how he can inherit eternal life. And you, if you read the Bible carefully, you can already see maybe a flaw in his logic. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus is about to set the record straight. Verse 18. He says, why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. In classic Jesus fashion, he answers a question with a question. And he says, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Now, Jesus could mean a variety of things. Did you know that some people use this verse actually to say that Jesus didn't claim to be the son of God? That he was trying to cast that off. I don't agree with that reading. I don't think that's what makes sense of the teaching of Jesus, not just here, but in other places in the Gospels. I think that this means at least two things. The first is, is that Jesus says, if you want to call me good, you must also call me God. No one is good except God alone. So if you want to call me 
good teacher, you have to be ready to also call me God. Jesus is so not interested in pats on the back. He doesn't need them. He doesn't need flattery. He deserves worship. And so he doesn't want someone to just say, good teacher, to say, you're a nice guy. No one is good except God alone. But second, not only is Jesus trying to say something about himself, he's trying to say something about this young man before him. If no one is good except God alone, this rich young ruler, very self-assured in his goodness, is also among those who are not good. Jesus throws back this question in response to the question he has asked to tell something about himself and to make sure that he is pointing out, young man, you may not be accurate in how you see yourself. He wants that man, for his own good, to see the disparity between himself and God alone. And so Jesus says in verse 19, You know the commandments, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, you shall not defraud, honor your father and mother. Jesus rattles off the last six of the ten commandments we just went through in the book of Exodus. He swaps out coveting with defrauding though. It's interesting that Jesus is referring to part of what Hollis just preached on as the greatest commandment. It's interesting that you see that as two things, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. But any New Testament that you read in has the title, the greatest commandment. It's one thing. And so Jesus here decides to test this young man's goodness with how he treats those around him, with how he is loving his neighbor as himself. And so that is the measuring stick that Jesus holds out. Of course, he means the whole thing. That you ought to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. But how he shows up in this moment, he says that are you loving your neighbor as yourself, as revealed in these Ten Commandments? And Jesus is about to teach this man something. Did you know that every New Testament scripture is an invitation for you and I to learn to live and love like Jesus. I hope that when we read scriptures like this, you see it as Jesus' invitation to you. Watch Jesus. Watch him show up. Watch him in action. Again, as I prayed to get into this sermon, Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take your yoke upon me, or take my yoke upon you, and learn from me. One translation that paraphrases this text says, Jesus is in its essence saying, walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. Jesus says, watch me. Watch me live and love and learn how to do it. How does Jesus interact with this young man as he gives him the commandments? Well, what does the man say? What kind of stuff is he giving Jesus uh, to work with? Verse 20 says, teacher declared, all these I've kept since I was a boy. Now, it's so easy. What do you want to do with this? Like roll your eyes, scoff, like are you kidding me? Now, would it be surprising for you to find out that within Judaism, there is an understanding that people could obey the law like that? That when somebody said, all these I've kept since I was a young boy, that they might actually be telling the truth. If they were to follow the commandments just from the outward action perspective and not think about the inward heart posture that Jesus would go on to teach in the Sermon on the Mount, that they could answer that question, I have obeyed all these since I was a child, and be telling what they believed to be the truth. And we'll see Jesus doesn't fight him on whether he obeyed all that stuff. So suspend judgment with me for a moment and watch Jesus. Verse 21, Jesus looked at him and loved him. This is that moment of narration that Mark throws in this text that has shaped my faith perhaps more than any text over the past five years. Jesus looked at him and loved him. This is not a glance. This is the penetrating gaze of Jesus. This is the one who in Scripture is is recorded as having seen the hearts of of people that would come and interact with him. This look is intense. It's examining. It's scrutinizing. 
it sees all the way down to who this man is. Jesus sees his heart and he loves him. That word love comes from the word agape love. It's the kind of love that God deserves from us and it's the kind of love that God gives to us. Jesus looks at him and loves him. This is the frame that Jesus puts around not just everyone, but around his creation. God so what? Loved the world that he gave. It's how Jesus frames his approach and the way that he interacts with you and me and with his creation. This man standing before Jesus is looked at and loved despite how different he is from Jesus. Of course, one glaring difference is Jesus is the unique son of God and this is just a dude, right? doesn't get more different than that. But second, this young man had great wealth. Wealth that he could trust in so much that it gave him a sense of confidence that he could get through this life with his wealth. Jesus came from among the poor. The Son of Man didn't have a place to lay his head. Jesus is looking at and loving someone very different from himself. Are you ever called to love someone different than yourself? Yeah, any hands for that one, right? (laughs) Are you ever called to love someone who is just radically different than you? Maybe your neighbor, or your friend, or your parent, or I don't know, your child, or maybe even your spouse. Are you ever called to love someone different than yourself? Then watch Jesus in action. Love is the lens through which he looks. If this young man came to me and I was Jesus, I don't think I would have reacted this way. And I'm not even Jesus. I know that's like I have to tell you, right? (laughs) I don't know that I would just look and love. And Jesus would have way more right to act differently towards this man than I would have. Jesus could have looked at him and sneered at his audacious and arrogant claim. Really? You've kept all these commands since you were a boy? You can almost imagine Jesus doing this contemptuous slow clap, congratulating (laughs) his moral obedience, right? Right? Jesus could have looked at him and condemned him. You liar. How dare you say, did, I, did you not hear me just say only God is good and you're trying to say you're good? Jesus could have looked at him and rejected him. I don't have time for people like you. Are you kidding me? The high and mighty, the ones who think they have it all together, the self-righteous, self-justifying jerks like you, I don't have time for people. Jesus could have said all of those things. What does Jesus do? Jesus looks at him and loves him. This is the framing effect that God wants you and I to put around the people in our lives and the situations that God throws our way, that we look and love. Have you ever been looked at and loved? Where you just know that person has your best in their mind's eye. They want your good. They are radically for you. Have you ever been looked at and loved? It's transformational. It really does change you. But have you ever been looked at and judged or rejected or hated or cursed? That somebody looks at you and says something like, you said what? They look at you and say, you did what? They look at you and say, you, you voted for who? <laughs> they look at you and they say, you got a divorce? You struggled with alcohol? You're in how much debt? Have you ever been looked at like that? What does that do for you? Does that make you feel like you can conquer the world? No, it takes you down a notch. And what's your instinct? You want to do it right back. You judge me, I'll judge you. Eye for eye, right? When you are looked at and rejected or judged or hated or cursed, it makes you want to follow suit. But there's one incredible thing that you are forgetting when you are tempted to look like that. You see that Jesus looked at you and loved you. How great a salvation we have in Jesus Christ. How can we be looked at and loved like Jesus looks at and loves us and then judge or dismiss or hate or leave or lust or revile or ignore or curse? See, God's done, again, maybe more in me through this verse, than any verse. So over a number of years, God slowly and patiently showed me that sometimes I am so concerned with looking at someone else and wanting to change them 
that I miss out and never get to looking and loving. I look and I want to manage. Or I look and I want them to be different. Or I look and I just think, man, if you could step up in this way, life would sure be easier for me. It took me years to see that. Now, I mention this many times, um, and I don't mention it actually, like I don't even necessarily like mentioning it. Uh, Stuff I mention from up here is not like so like, you know, you can have a voyeuristic view into my life. I mention stuff because I hope that God can use it, and maybe it might be of help. So as part of my own discipleship journey, a number of years ago, I started to see a therapist. I had given advice that people, other people should go see therapists, and I never bothered to do it myself. I did a round of executive coaching, and when I got to the end of it, when we went to renew the contract, I went, oh, I don't think I need an executive coach. I think I need a therapist. And so I found one, and for the last number of years, I've met with uh, two different therapists. And one thing I found out about 18 months, it took me this long to realize this, as we're setting goals for therapy, and my therapist, again, lovingly and gently, almost the words of Jesus to me, said, you know, Adam, an inappropriate, unacceptable goal for therapy is to change someone else. The only appropriate goal, the only acceptable goal is to change you. You can be different. You can show up differently in the situations that God gives you. You can react differently when life doesn't go your way. And only you can change how you look at others and how you approach your life and how you show up and react. You will not find wholeness and peace in this life if your life is one extended reaction to other people. Until you get clear on what you want and the kind of person God is calling you to be, you will not find any measure of meaningful peace. And so here, in the midst of this learning about how I often look at people, God plunks down this verse. He looked at him and loved him. And I went, that's what you want from me. You want me to approach my relationships in this life by looking and loving Not looking and judging, not looking and wishing they were different, not looking even in managing people. Look and love. See, if you take that posture of love towards other people, it is the toughest, most assertive, most aggressive, least passive, least anxious, least reactive way to be in your relationships because you decide first how to be. Don't you ever confuse love with being a pushover, or love with being wimpy. Choosing to love is exactly how God asks the most aggressive, assertive person that ever existed. He decides, in spite of all the circumstances swirling around him, how he wants to be and never wavers and never changes. He looks and loves always. Love is not wimpiness. It's not some cute accessory or sentiment in the faith. It's not a cop-out when you don't have the guts to get real mad and yell and condemn the world as going to hell in a handbasket. It's not just not nice, it's necessary. See, Jesus intended this to be our calling card. Listen to what he says in John 13. He says, a new command I give you, what? Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Love is supposed to be our calling card. The identifying marker of how Christians are viewed and seen and experienced in the world. It's not a schmaltzy attitude that we're supposed to hold when the world around us seems to be out of our control. It's how we proactively reach out into the world and make a real difference. It's so important. It's not just how we're known. It's what redeems things. Listen to this in 1 Peter. Above all, love each other deeply. Because why? Because love covers over a multitude of sins. It's not only necessary, it's redemptive. Consult any systematic theology worth its salt. And do you know what you will find among the attributes of God? Yeah, he's omniscient, he's omnipotent, he's omnipresent. God is Love. You find it in 1 John 4, 8. It says God is love. What that means is every time God acts in the world, it's out of love. So when God judges, which he does, when God convicts, which he does, when God corrects, which he does, he does so in love. Don't sit there thinking that Adam's saying, oh, just look and love and therefore accept everything. Tolerate everything. 
never take a stand for everything. Watch Jesus. Verse 21. Look, Jesus looked at him and loved him. And then what's he say in verse 21, which should show up on the screen behind me? One thing you lack, he said. Go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. Jesus, out of his love, confronts this man. He doesn't say, you know what, I can see you're really trying hard. It's no big deal. You just, you do you and like I'll, you know, I'll, I'll react. He says, one thing you lack. That young man would have known exactly what Jesus meant. It means it doesn't matter how much you've obeyed so far, you are still missing the mark. You're not following me. Are you ready, willing, and able to respond in real time to my leading and teaching and guiding of you in your real life? Will you do it? And again, Jesus, seeing the heart, knew that this man would struggle, knew that he would turn his back and walk away. Jesus goes out of his way, in love, to hit this man exactly where it hurts. He goes after that thing that made following Jesus seem impossible. It only takes one thing to fall short of full obedience to God. Jesus puts his finger in this wound out of love. Did you know that sometimes we use obedience in one area of our life to mask disobedience in another? Did you know that sometimes we let our obedience in one area license sin in another area? Jesus knew that. He said, you are distracted by all the stuff you're doing right. There is one thing you lack. And we know Jesus hit the mark. Why? Watch this man react. Mark 10, 22. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. So great that as I mentioned before in verse 24, it says that he had wealth that he could trust in. That's some wealth. If you look that up in the, uh, in the New Testament Greek, a phrase like that means that he had a buttload of money. It's technical. I had to search the Greek dictionaries for that, okay? And Jesus points out exactly what will make him challenged in his faith. And he turns around and walks away. His face fell and he goes home because he had great wealth. The call in our lives is to look and love. And sometimes love can say, you're wrong. You've missed the mark. That's the call in our lives. And this call can be tough. The great theologian Mark Twain once wrote, it ain't those parts of the Bible that I can't understand that bother me. It's the parts I do understand. (laughs) And what happens when we see a text like this, that we are to look and love? We do two things. We dilute and we deflect. We hear a teaching like this, that we need to look and love. And the first thing we do is we try to dilute it. We make the demand lower. We think like, does that just mean like, be nice? Or we try to dilute it that it doesn't mean everything it could. Like, well, yeah, I'm going to look at love, but not people who think this way. Or not people who act this way. Or not people who, I'm going to go there again, vote this way. Doesn't mean you have to accept everything. But the call in your life is to look and love. That's the way Jesus is, and that's the way we are to be. And second, we deflect. We find some way to say, well, that's not really for me. I'm the exception, not the rule. I'm going to find some other commandment that I vibe with better or I'm better suited with, and I'll obey that one. But the call on our lives is the whole counsel of God, not just the parts that we vibe with best. So how do you do this? How do you look and love like Jesus? One, you remember. Every morning, I would encourage you. One, remember. Remember that Jesus looked at you and loved you. While you were yet a sinner, Christ died for the ungodly. Every morning, you thank your God above that he looked at you and loved you. Second, you decide in advance that this is the person you want to be. Did you know that most of the situations you arrive at in life are not surprises? You can find them on this thing called your calendar. You know they're coming. They're not a surprise. They're not a shock. So what if, in some sort of repetitive fashion, maybe it's daily, decide in advance, I am going to look at this situation. I am going to look at this person 
and love them before I get snookered in to reacting in a way that is ungodly, I decide in advance that I will react how Jesus reacts. This is one of the greatest uh, misconceptions of the Christian faith. We think that we can just show up and get it right. Like we see Jesus turning the other cheek and we go like, dude, I'm just going to show up. I'm ready for it, right? (laughs) That's like Christianity 501 or whatever. It's like that is Jesus took a lifetime to get there. We see Jesus' life from 30 to 33, but did you know that to get to 30, Jesus had to be 28 and 25 and 21 and 18 and 15? And do you know what Jesus was doing? Getting ready. He was praying and fasting and reading Scripture and giving to the poor. All of these private things so that when his public life came, he was ready. Jesus wasn't surprised about any of this, and he was ready He was not caught off guard. Listen to the words of Dallas Willard. It is part of the misguided and whimsical condition of humankind that we so devoutly believe in the power of effort at the moment of action alone to accomplish what we want and completely ignore the need for character change in our lives as a whole. The general human failing is to want what is right and important, but at the same time not commit to the kind of life that will produce the action we know to be right and the condition we want to enjoy. This is the feature of human character that explains why the road to hell is paved with good intentions. We intend what is right, but we avoid the life that would make it a reality. You hear what he's saying? You can't just show up and get everything right. You've got to get ready. Jesus modeled that in his own life. Let me just uh, poke fun at one more Christian thing. I just love to do that. It's just, it's my own sin, I guess. I don't know. I like to take Christian stuff and be like, really? Like, is it really like that? Um, Let me put up a series of four letters behind you. Go for it. Do you know what those stand for? What would Jesus do? Now, I have one clarification for this and two problems with it. The one clarification is when you ask that, you have to be asking, what would Jesus do if he had my life, if he had my relationships, my job, my situation? You can't just say, what would Jesus do? You know what he'd do? Raise the dead person or walk on water or multiply fishes. I know exactly what Jesus would do. We know. It's in the Bible. You need to ask, what would Jesus do if he had my life? And here's the two problems. The first is, we don't ask what would Jesus do in enough situations. You know what we ask? When our back's against the wall and the stakes are high. And we think, like, what would Jesus do? Right? We don't ask what would Jesus do when the pressure's off. We don't ask Jesus the night before we start our day. How would Jesus start my morning if my morning were his morning? We don't ask him when the stakes are low. Hey, how would Jesus handle this blessing? How would Jesus handle this free time? How would Jesus handle my extra resources? We don't ask, what would Jesus do in enough situations? We only ask him when the demands are the highest and we're just stumped on how to do it. We need to be asking, what would Jesus do in all sorts of situations? And second, we don't ask, what would Jesus do over long enough time periods? We ask, what would Jesus do like in the next like 30 seconds to get out of this jam? What if we started asking, what would Jesus do over the next year or five years? or 10, or 20, or what would Jesus do during this entire marriage, which is hopefully decades and decades long? What would Jesus do with these kids who hopefully live, outlive me? What would Jesus do with this friendship that I intend to foster and grow and make something significant out of it? We need to ask, what would Jesus do in more situations and over much longer time frames? And finally, as I close, third, how do you get this done? How do you actually live and love like Jesus? Well, you remember You decide in advance, and finally, you rely on the Spirit. No matter how much you prep, God does throw a wicked curveball. And life will surprise you. And He will throw things in your way that you were not ready for, no matter how much you prepared. But Jesus said, I am with you to the end of the age. And you have real-time access to the power of, of the God of the universe to help you navigate those curveballs that God will throw your way. So this morning, we've looked at a scripture that shaped my faith. We saw Jesus look at a man and love him. And I submit to you that that is the frame that Jesus wants you and wants me to place around every relationship and every situation we encounter in this life, that we look and love. And no, it doesn't mean accept everything and never take a stand. 
but it means that your intent, your heart, down to who you are, must always be love. Yes, that'll tell some people they're wrong. Yes, that'll say I disagree. Yes, that'll say I think you hurt me and I think we need to make amends. But you look and love always. Amen?